Hey, good morning, everyone. Morning. 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 All right, let's wait another minute. Let's see if somebody is anybody else shows up. Uh, if you let me post the meeting notes uh, on the chat and you can add yourself to the attendance. And I think we can start with uh, basic stand-up. So I'm Ricardo, I'm one of the co-chairs and I don't have any updates, so I'll put up an agenda. Um, so I have a roadmap uh, discussion for the SIG uh, and then there's a few other items, uh, Volcano and Kata containers. Uh, so we'll, I'll just go around the list so that, of what I see on the attendance. So, um, Philip or Philip. Yes, good morning. I'm Philip Romain from ARM. So working as part of the um, infrastructure group in ARM, no, no particular update today. Hi. Hey. Uh, cool. Uh, uh, Dims, is that Dims? Then yes. Hi, uh, I'm just lurking. Thank you, Ricardo. I don't have any update. Okay, cool. Um, Diane. Diane. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure if you said Diane or not. Yeah, um, no. I I don't have updates. I'm still understanding how all this works. So I'm pretty much in, you know, observing mode still right now. Okay, cool. Um, then we have Eric. Um, no update on my end, really. I just, that was interesting listening to the roadmap and also just um, seeing where I can help with maybe doing some of those um, analysis and some of the existing projects. Okay, great. Uh, and wow. Hey, Klaus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, no special update, but uh, we got a good news that we got the three sponsor for Volcano Sandbox. Great, great. Yes, yes, that's a great news. Yeah. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you all for your support. Okay. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. And and then who else is? Uh, we have Ray. Hello, uh, it's actually my first meeting. Um, I'm on the, I was on the last release team for 118. I'm just uh, lurking also. Okay, great. And Tao. Uh, it's my second meeting here, and th this time I'm giving the Kata containers introduction. Awesome. Okay, um, I think that's about it. Um, did I miss anyone? I think, uh, oh, Raja, Raja. Hi, uh, I, I'm just joining to listen in. I think we were on the virtual side of the picture last time. I just joined to just follow. Okay, cool. Yeah, we had the, some discussion about the virtual cubelet schedule for today, but uh, it was removed from the agenda so i'm not sure so the team maybe they wanted to you know go back and 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 look up, you know some of the requirements that, that were being asked for incubation sure 
Yeah, I think Ria gave an update. So I just joined to just see how the second time the roadmap discussions go. Um, I just wanted to follow. Cool. Um, and yeah, so I think that's it we won. Okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, so we wanted to talk about the, the roadmap for, um, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, so, so yeah, so the roadmap and, and maybe I'll share my screen here. So, oh, oh one more thing, um, we, we're looking for somebody to take notes on, on, on this meetings. Uh, anyone wants to volunteer? I think it's kind of hard to, to find volunteers, but, but if you know anybody who's interested, uh, so we, well, I mean, somebody needs to run the meeting, but at the same time, somebody needs to take notes, but I'm actually been running the meetings, but if, um, I, I run the meetings, basically I, I can't, take notes and at the same time but uh, but if you uh it, it you, you have access to right now to the the notes and everyone can write to you on them so if you want to just say uh, want to write something about the meeting feel free to free, feel free to do it oh thanks for the motorbike yeah so that's that's some background so so uh now they they because there are so many virtual events and uh, people are doing this virtual background so i just decided to to do it one of them all right so yeah we're impressed by the motorbike and the background <laughs> <laughs> yeah so let me share my screen uh, Okay, cool. So yeah, so uh, Quentin and I got together maybe like three weeks ago and then we talked about uh, the roadmap for this uh, SIG. Uh, so if you, if you know other people who are interested and wanna participate, feel free to you know, pass the word. And uh, we wanna get uh, more participation, basically any, any, any projects related to runtime, uh, any technologies uh, they want to discuss, uh, so they're, I mean, they're, they're in the scope of the SIG. Uh, so one of the things that, oh, there's Quentin. Hey, Quentin, do you want to say something? Uh, hi, guys. Sorry, I, I just joined late. Uh, no, do c carry on. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so we, we looked at the health of the projects. Uh, so, uh, or, or the, the regular check-ins that we have to do for the health of the projects. Uh, so we have uh, currently all these projects and and the different stages and uh, CNCF. So of course Kubernetes, uh, Containerd. Uh, there's a couple in incubating, Cryo and Harbor. So uh, there's also Sandbox. Uh, we have Kubevirt, uh, Kata, Kube Edge, uh, the virtual kubelet. And I'm just going to read through these. I mean, uh, if you have any anything to talk about these or any comments, just let me know. Uh, the, uh, then we have Dragonfly. I think it's Dragonfly is uh, voting to be in incubation right now. Uh, and there's build packs. And then uh, the SIG also wants to identify any gaps in some of these projects. Uh, some of these uh, projects don't cover all of the C, uh, cloud native landscape. Uh, and then, so we want to bring in some, uh, you know, insights and, and possibly projects that want to be donated uh, into the foundation. So uh, types of workloads are like AI and big data pipelines. Then we have the sandboxes or special container runtimes like Firecracker, uh, Kata Containers, and GVisor. Uh, there's also maybe some bare metal type of tools like, um, you know, deployment of bare metal machines or, or uh, different types of kernel, uh, Linux kernels, to, for to running for running workloads, and then things related to multi-tenancy. When 
Um, people want to run different uh, tenants in, 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 in the same machines, for example, right? So they, then you want to have some sort of isolation. So there's no um, security compromises and, and, you know, one tenant cannot see the other, those type of things. Uh, so um, other types of gaps, maybe some, some gaps that, that uh, people haven't thought about that much, uh, you know, for example, like the WebAssembly sandboxes. So, uh, so th that's a pretty early uh, project or, or a pretty early spec. Uh, so I I've been following some of it, but that also may be in the scope uh, where people may want to compile uh, certain code and into WebAssembly and then uh, run that WebAssembly in some uh, Kubernetes nodes or or some bare metal instances. So that's also within the scope. And we wanna continue educating the community. Uh, so for um, uh, them to know about all these different new cutting edge technologies. And uh, so we would like to invite people to present. Uh, I'd say one example is Kata Containers is giving an overview today. Uh, and then some of the other projects, you know, I, th I think about also OCI, uh, Open Container Initiative, and some folks some might want to come in. I did actually get check, uh, checked in with some of the Gvisor folks and I, got, and, I, and I got some interest and I've been a contributor uh, to Kata Containers. So what we have Tao today, we'll talk about Kata Containers. Uh, I've yet to reach out uh, to the Firecracker community. So they'll be, uh, hopefully somebody will come in and present and, and give some updates. And obviously, uh, we want to do some due diligence on some of these projects. Uh, so uh, there's some currently in that process. So Harbor is uh, being reviewed by several six. Uh, so we'll comp comp compile. We have a uh, document that will compile all the feedback from all the six and provide that as a recommendation to the TOC so they can uh, decide whether they want to uh, graduate. So hardware is looking at graduating. Uh, and then Quay is also coming in. Uh, there's another, uh, Quay is trying to go for incubation. So there will be some due diligence. And there's also interaction with other six and other groups. We have the Kubernetes SIG node, uh, there's app delivery. So um, some of these um, projects uh, have uh, operators and sometimes those fall within the scope of the SIG app delivery. Uh, for example, there's uh, serverless type of specifications that may also fall within SIG, SIG app delivery. There's also a conversation about maybe creating a SIG serverless group, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and yeah, and we want to identify, like I mentioned in the beginning of the meeting, uh, uh, folks who can participate in terms of uh, writing notes for these meetings, uh, so a scribe. And then we're looking for a couple of tech leads, or, or there's two spots for tech leads. So for people interested in, uh, you know, with the technologies and uh, learning more about uh, some of these projects and, and helping with the due diligence, uh, we, need, we need help in that aspect. Uh, so yeah, that's 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 all I have for the roadmap. I think uh, Quinton and I uh, came up with this list. And so Quinton, do you have any other any thoughts about these and anything you want to talk about? Uh, no, I mean I just really wanted to open it up. That was kind of just seed the discussion uh, and just point out that we had to you know kind of get going as a as a SIG. Uh, we have a bunch of responsibilities. This is sort of my first pass at some of the things we need to do. Um, and, and I would like to invite other people to contribute uh, any other ideas they have and, and we can start putting together a, a sort of plan of action, who's going to do what, when, etc. Uh, would be the next sort of steps. There's one other item that I should probably add to the list here, which is that I realized Brian Grant, who was one of our TOC liaisons, um, is no longer on the TOC. Um, so we need a new TSC liaison. Uh, I actually took a liberty um, of speaking uh, to one of the new TSC members uh, who has provisionally sort of expressed interest in being that new liaison. Uh, she just wants to speak about, uh, think about it some more, uh, but I, I would imagine we'll have an answer there fairly soon. Okay, I think this will be um, 
Alina, right? So maybe. Elena, yeah. 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 Cool. Yes, yeah, so we need a new TOC liaison. So. And sorry, I should have actually spoken to the SIG before I did that. I just happened to speak to Elaine about other things first and mentioned it to her and she expressed interest. So ap apologies for that. Uh, we can, if, if the SIG doesn't want her as a TOC liaison, we, I'm sure we could tell her that. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping that's not the case. Yeah, okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll, um, we'll figure out, right? So do, do we need two liaisons. Uh, some SIGs actually have, um, one liaison so i think it might be better to have two just in case of redundancy or yes exactly okay cool yeah this is one of the biggest sigs um and brendan our other liaison is one of our more busy tsc members <laughs> um so so yeah i think for both reasons we could have two and elena seems to be very uh, interested in getting pretty hands-on involved it overlaps with a lot of the stuff she does at work so so i think we can expect to get uh, a fair amount of her time availability. Great, great. So like uh, Quentin said, I'd like to open it up to any comments, questions by uh, uh, people on the call and any, any thoughts. Uh, I, I, I think some of, the, some of you are already involved in some of these projects or some technologies related to these projects and, and the scope of the SIG, so. Yeah, it's Philip here. I'll make I'll make a comment. I think for for us for us, we have some people from the arm side who are actually <clears throat> tracking or looking into some of these projects and contributing. And I think it'd be good to have uh, uh, tracking as to that these projects actually um, work across arch architectures and uh, are not only tied to a, a particular one, or if they are, that there is a plan or some thinking around how these can can be deployed on on, on multiple different platforms. Yeah, that sounds sounds very reasonable. Um, off the top of my head, you know, one of the problems with with some of these uh, requests is that um, you know it's these chicken and egg situations where uh, people don't necessarily have the resources, the, the people available to do the work required to make these things run on other platforms. Um, so, but but if Arm is willing to to do that work inside the projects to to get them to that point, uh, then I think uh, we can certainly kind of um, make it visible uh, through the SIG, uh, which projects are and are not, and, and those kinds of things. Does that yeah. correspond? Yeah, no, I, think that's, I think that's fair. And I think part of the of the, uh, the the effort here is to at least identify that uh, as a start. And so, um, you know, if, if we can pick it up for some of the projects, we'll do. If, if we cannot, or if some others are interested and can contribute to it, I think it's good to, to think about it. And when when it will happen will depend on on you know who wants to use it or not or the resource available and if yeah. maybe some in the community want to do it, but uh, if it's not um, documented or, or it you know it's kind of hidden in a code somewhere it's 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 harder to kind of uh, go yeah. and, and pull that. Yeah, yeah, we could we could possibly do things like uh, ask the projects, you know questions in their health uh, checks we could ask them whether they run on other architectures if not are they planning to uh, and and if they haven't got any concrete plans to do so do they have any estimates of the amount of effort required I would imagine the the amount of effort required to make these things work is going to be wildly different for different projects depending on how they you know what languages they're written in etc um, so um, yeah, we could certainly ask them these questions and expose that to the community so people are at least aware of, of what the status is. Does that sound reasonable? No, no, it's, uh, I fully agree. And, and it's not fair to just ask the projects to do all of that if there's no real uh, um, need for them at that time. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Documenting and, and some of the answers, might, the answers to those questions, maybe we don't know. You know, we don't know whether our project runs on X, Y, or Z, and, uh, and we have no plans to find that out either because we don't have a need for it. I mean, that's a reasonable answer, I think. Oh, that's all okay. I mean, I, it, it's to make people think about it when they when yeah. they uh, yeah. look at the SIG, I think, and it's a good uh, it's a good flag to have. Yeah, sounds good. And, it, and and also, I think from the ARM perspective, I mean, you you could bring some use cases, right? So why would uh, some people may want to have this pro particular project support ARM, right? So uh, yeah, no, I fully agree. A, a lot of the 
people in our team working on some of these are based in Shanghai. So the timeline for joining these calls is a bit tricky, but uh, definitely, yes, we can, we can help support that. Excellent. Great. Any, any other comments from any other uh, attendees? Or? So yeah, if, if you feel like something's missing here too, feel free to uh, contribute. Um, I think we covered quite a quite a, a bit of uh, different things, but uh, yeah, there, we may not necessarily have everything. So, cool. So, just one one final suggestion on that. Um, uh, what I what I would propose is that we set a timeline, which is that we leave this open for comments and uh, finalization for the next two weeks. Uh, at our meeting in two weeks time, we, we prioritize these things and try and uh, put names to some of these items um, so that we can sort of get get going on them. Um, so if, if anyone on the call is able to find people in their companies that are willing to do some of this work, I think uh, two weeks time would be a great great opportunity to bring the names along or bring the people along um, and uh, and we can we can sort of figure out what we'd like to tackle first and and what we can leave until later for example yeah that makes that makes sense to me all right so so we have a uh, next item on the agenda uh, uh, Volcano uh, received three sponsors for Sandbox, so it's that's fantastic. So, uh, so that that means that it will be in Sandbox. Uh, Klaus, you want to make any comments about that uh, or anything that? Oh, no special comments. I think uh, uh, that's a good idea. that's a good news to uh, to us. Yeah, that was one of the things I spoke to Elena about. Um, was mm -hmm. whether she would be prepared to do that, and, and she agreed, etc. So that's where that how that came about. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this fills a uh, gap in Kubernetes now. So because uh, you know, Quinton and I we were talking about uh, you know having just the bare jobs from Kubernetes doesn't kind of. Uh, it, it, it's pretty uh, raw, right? So, so mm -hmm. uh, Volcano fits in, uh, fills in that gap where, where you want more complex type of uh, batch workloads and for example, for data pipelines and yeah, and big data type of yeah. applications. Yeah. yeah. I guess I have a question about the role of this group. Should we be seeking to fill those gaps uh, actively? Or is it sort of that the participation comes from the other side where typically they're asking to be added? Um, are you talking about projects now, Diane? Yeah, projects, just new projects. Do, we, do you go out and recruit new projects that look like good candidates or is it typically done the other way around where? Uh, that's, a, that's a very profound question and maybe more profound than you even realized when asked. Asking it. So, so uh, we actually need to be doing both. Uh, we need to be uh, proactively identifying gaps in the in the uh, CNCF portfolio of projects uh, that we think need to be filled, and we need to be actively identifying projects to fill those gaps. Uh, in addition to that, there will inevitably be, and the, that's been the vast majority of the more recent projects, ha have been projects that have come to us and wanted to be part of the CNCF. Um, so I think. You know, in an ideal world, there would be a healthy flow of both of those. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, like the projects that I see within Red Hat, it would be reasonable to sort of uh, try to recruit them, basically. That's, that's reasonable. Yes. 
It's definitely, I mean, to the extent that they fit into this SIG, and, and of course, if they fit into other SIGs, uh, you know, you, you could also um, do that. And Red Hat's, you know, brought lots of projects to the CNCF already, and, and I'm sure will continue to do so. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think if you see any technology that may not be part of the CNCF and, and yeah, the, you, for example, I, I've reached out to some of the WebAssembly people. So um, that's one area, for example, that uh, I, don't, I see a gap, right? So uh, if you see any other gap that is kind of similar or, or, or related to runtime, you know, uh, yeah, feel free to kind of, um, talk to some other communities and uh, see if they, there's some some project that could be part of the CNCF. Okay, sounds good. Especially in the big data and AI ML space, that's where I'll take a look. Yeah, yeah, so there, uh, there may be some other things related to how you run AI, uh, maybe frameworks for, for machine learning or deep learning, those type of things, yeah. I don't think we we have that type of thing, but then we have also have to see that they don't overlap with some other things that in the Linux Foundation because the Linux Foundation also has this other group called Linux AI or AI Foundation or something like that. Okay. Yeah, I think my observation is is that industry. I mean, it's it's obviously super important and super interesting, etc. Um, but they tend to be, you know. ML people, uh, ML specialists, often in you know the, the TensorFlow groups and the PyTorch groups, and, right. and a lot of the the work around there ha happens there. And there's various data groups as well, standardizing data interchange formats and all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, I think that that we should not sort of venture into those spaces because they have their own foundations in general. This is not because the CNCF or, or not, not because the Linux Foundation has such a thing, but but I think in general it doesn't fit uh, with the CNCF. I think the CNCF is is more about the actual infrastructure to, you know, enable those workloads. Um, and so I think, so Volcano is a great example. Volcano is not actually, you know, the, the, the framework for building uh, for building AI things, it's it's really to facilitate those kinds of workloads on Kubernetes, and th those I think are the kinds of projects that we we will want to be looking at. And there are many others in that space, I'm sure that that we could go and ferret out, but some of them are not as obvious as one might think. Like Kubeflow, for instance, I wonder if they're already part of uh, some other group. You know, if they've already Kubeflow doesn't you know facilitates running frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. Yes, um, yes. So I think that that would be a great example of, of a good project. I think there's a history there. I'm not intimately familiar with the history, but but Kubeflow is not obviously part of the CNCF at the moment. And uh, it would be good to get a clear answer why that is the case. Um, and, you know, this SIG hasn't been around the whole time. But I know there is some history there. Um, and, and I agree, that would be great to, like, figure out what's going on there and whether it makes sense to invite them to be part of the CNCF. Yeah. So I think uh, one area that is interesting is the ML ops area. So there's some, yeah, it's how you run these workloads, right? So, um, yep. Yeah, they have okay. very, very different properties in, in some cases, uh, very, very different properties than um, you know, traditional back, batch workloads, for example. Many of these things run for many weeks on end. They, uh, you know, very sensitive to node failures, typically, uh, unless you have very elaborate schemes to prevent that. Um, so if one node fails during the, you know, four week run, then the whole run basically gets corrupted and you have to re run the whole thing, which is bad, uh, and they run on expensive hardware, so it's even doubly bad, uh, et cetera. That's my life. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably know far more about it than I do, than Diane, but that's my, that's my understanding of it. Yeah. Well, I benchmark those sorts of models. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect, yeah. So, yeah, oh, the, but they, they do want it. They do run on Kubernetes and OpenShift, so, and so, and there are a lot of mid-sized applications and models that don't run quite that long that but it's complicated yeah 
even Kubeflow, it's such a mixed bag of components. It's a complex. Yeah, yeah. So Diane, if, if you would uh, want to kind of spearhead a, a little kind of working group to go and dive into that area with Klaus and whoever else is interesting, interested and perhaps um, think about either a white paper or, or some other form of education where we can teach the world how, you know, how ML stuff runs on Kubernetes and where the challenges are and what we're doing to fill them. Uh, I think that would be super useful because there are a lot of questions in that space, I think. I'd definitely be interested in doing that in the future. I'm writing two white papers right now and I'm so knee deep in a benchmark right now. Okay. <laughs> I can't do it right now, but I would love to like sure. place but, my you know, maybe the homework, maybe what you the work you do in those white papers, for example, will will set you up well to um, you know, produce one for this purpose, which may overlap with those, I'm guessing. I don't know. Cool. Great. Yeah, fantastic. All right, so uh, so next item we have on the agenda is uh, Kata Containers introduction. So I think, uh, Tao, you want to talk about this? Or do you have anything to share? Yeah. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, let me stop there. Okay. 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 Can, can you see it? Yep. Uh, cool. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my, my name is Taupan, and uh, I work for Ant Financial in the the Chinese internet payment company. And uh, I've been working on Kata containers since the very beginning, and I'm one of the main maintainer and uh, main contributors to it. And the other day, Ricardo asked us to, if we can give some introduction to the to see ground time. So I'm here and uh, it's good to to know everyone and see the, how the SIG how ground time works. And uh, well, I hope we can have some co collaboration in the future. And so I just begin. Uh, we, we started when by observing the traditional containers then to uh, that is deployed by by users today and or several years ago, and uh, they are they are mostly isolated by namespaces, C groups, and they have the they share the same Linux kernel on the host, and then that's how that's that's before Kata containers, and uh, we we see some something to do here. We want. We introduced a virtual machine layer and the insert and and the and the middle layer between the containers and the real hardware and the host kernel. And with, with this, we can have some kind of this better resource isolation and better security on the host. So basically, if you run cloud containers, you can you, you can make give, give your can give your give your users or your your the untrusted users to let them run your run some workload on your machine, and you you do not care about if they they made some they do some bad things on on, the, on each other or on your host. So the the main idea is that the the virtual machine interface is a industry proven interface that is being used in the IS world for for many years so we just inherit to that and with this we can we, we combine the best of the two world we have the have the speed of containers and also have the security of our of our virtual machine oh, could could you just uh, explain so this diagram you have here um, is is basically just virtual machines uh, that, that's how virtual machines work so just just explain yeah. uh, how this is different than just a virtual machine and uh, no, if you if you install a virtual machine you have a four vir virtual ho four four guest kernel and four guest operating systems we we, we by 
putting a virtual machine here, we use a very lightweight virtual machine and also we customize the guest kernel and we saw also we customize the guest, guest operating system. All, everything is reduced down to very minimum to just support running a container. So you, you, for example, if you, if you launch a virtual machine on AWS, it will at least take several minutes or several hours before several years ago we started this. But uh, we, with cloud containers, you can have a fully, you can have a running container inside a virtual machine in one or two seconds. Okay, thank you. And uh, th this is the, the architecture we currently have. The, there are two, actually, the, 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 above, the above one is the, the architecture we, we used to have until last year. For every container inside the sandbox, we have a kata shim here, and also we, we have cut container, if you are running container D, there's a container D shim. So, so there, there may be many shims in the system and uh, many interaction layers. And uh, we, uh, after working with the container D community, we, we introduced the container D shim v2 API so that container D can just call API to cut a container D shim. And with that, we remove all the interaction layers and all these components in, into just one, one component for per sandbox. Now it's not per per container. It's for for every sandbox we have. We we just have one one shim now. So that that's that's a very good um, simplification on kata kind of containers architecture and uh, a main drive for. For many users, many, many before that, many users are trying kata containers and think it, it is too heavy because there are many, too many too many processes to manage on the host, and uh, it's a nightmare for admins, for system admins. And uh, after we simplify the architecture, many users are, are starting to are starting to adopt kata containers in their production system right now. And the current status, we beside beside you can run very lightweight containers, virtual virtual machine containers, and that's a basic function. And now we we support many architectures, and and uh, we support different hypervisors. The Firecracker, Cloud Hypervisor, and Okram are all ended, I think, last year. And still Q, QEMU is the default one because it, it has most features, but uh, you, if you want to run some special workload and, then, and uh, want, want to have some different optimizations, you can use just use different hypervisors. Also, also we support different distributions. Mm, although the, the guest kernel is, is fixed, Okay, the guest case operating system is minimized. It can still be made of different distributions so that you can users can do very easy customization with it. Also, on, on the on, on the ecosystem integration, we support Cryo, Container D, Docker, and the Podman. So you you. you if your system run any of this, you can just install Kata Canners and run very easily. And uh, also, um, since Kata Canners is new to Kubernetes world, and we we many um, we, we are the main drive between uh, behind two two important Kubernetes features. The first one is cut the runtime class runtime classes. So we, with runtime class we can specify what which runtime you which which container runtime you want to you want to run inside in your pod yaml so you just say you you, you can justify a runtime class for kata containers and and uh, and and to your pod yaml say that i want to run this pod with kata so and sub, submit it to 
to to Kubernetes, it will be it will automatically schedule this the runtime the the pod to a to a node if then then can support Kata kernels, provided that you you have installed Kata there, of course. And also the, there's another feature that, that's called a pod overhead. The, the main benefit from the the main purpose of it is to to count uh, to account resource utilizations of the of a pod, of a pod itself instead of just the containers in this one server. Although there are there are there is still some overhead for every pod and every container, but that is not accounted. So. So when Kubernetes is trying to make some scheduling decision, the, there are situations that things can go very bad because there are resources. There are resources that Kubernetes thinks is free, but uh, it's actually being used, being active used by some unknown components. So right now, the port, the port, the, every port can define its own resource overhead, especially the CPU and uh, memory overhead. So with it, with the port overhead, the Kubernetes can have have a better view, resource overview of the entire cluster and uh, do better scheduling decisions. So that, that's the main main features we we've been we have put to the Kubernetes mainstream, and uh, both both of them I think they are they are they are data now. And, I, I'm not sure these years, but uh, they, 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 they master or, or one point fifteen maybe have the port overhead and class runtime. Run time class is is before that. I think it's one point thirteen or fourteen. So if you install Kubernetes, the, these features are automatically enabled right now. And uh, and uh, th this year we are looking to release Kata Kataners two point zero, and we are planning some important features. The first one is we we although we we have been minimizing our our resource resource consumption for every container and every pod, we we noticed that oh, I, I should have mentioned that right now the project is mostly written written in written by Go, Go, Go language, but uh, we have identified that the Go runtime is, is too heavy to, for some of the components. So we've been um, justifying some of the components. By justifying, I mean rewrite it in Rust. So right now we have, uh, in, alongside of the Go agent, we have a Rust agent that is being active testing and we plan to push it to the, and the default agent inside the guest in, in 2.0. And also the communication channel that now is, it is using gRPC, but uh, the actually the HTTP layer is not necessary for, for us. And so we think it, it, is, it is too heavy, so we, we, we write a TTRPC Rust to replace, replace the Go, Go RPC component. And also there's another thing that we want to do in the, in the to the, to the old time frame is the image pulling inside the, inside the sandbox. Right now in the architecture, the, the image, all the images are pulled by by CRI demons such as Cryo and Containerd, and but this this will have a main drawback that, and since the, since these CRI demons are no are uh, no the wide demons, they cannot enter, actually enter any user namespace user net especially user network namespace. But uh, for for Kata we the an important use case for Kata is to is for the cloud hyper, cloud cloud vendors. For the cloud vendors, they want they want they want they want to allow different users to run their containers and ports on on the same on the same host. But uh, 
different users will have different network. So we have we will have to pull the image inside a user's network namespace. So that's why we want to do the image pooling inside the inside the sandbox. And also with it, we can do some do some tricks about the image format so that we can we we can accelerate the image pooling process. For example, by instead of pull an entire image, we can just pull a very small metadata layer then can just then, then can construct a, a um, root FS namespace overview for the container, but it, but no data is actually pulled. So that the container can, we, we can start the container very instantly instead of having to wait to wait the entire image to be downloaded. That, that's a very useful use case for if, if, you, if you have a, have large images. For example, we, in, inside our company, we have gigabytes images and uh, this will in, reduce the container startup time from several minutes to just several seconds. Also in 2.0, <laughs> In 2.0 plan, we want to improve Kata containers observability and we, we will define Kata's own events API so that we can integrate it with, with projects just as permissions. And we also, we are defining some Kata specific debug, debug API so that users do not have to actually log into the container to debug their applications. And another feature we are we are looking at is to improve Kata containers IO stream handling. Right now, every SGD IO, IO stream is handled from container D to Kata to Kata's to the agent inside Kata. And there are there are too many layers. I think we we think there are many too, too many layers, and we we want to simplify this use case and. Uh, Make it easier to for for the for the for the control paths to upgrade them, themselves. And another main change we are trying we are actually actively working on is the code repository consolidation. Right now we have different repository for runtime for different schemes for proxy for agent. So we want to consolidate this code repository into just just a single repository, and so that it it will be easier for for new developers to just get clone and test their local changes. So that's that's all for the two dot oh plan. And uh, th this is our uh, th these are our community channels. We have uh, Kata Containers dot io. That's our main page and we have a github organization that's cut containers and uh, we have uh, IRC IRC channel and slack channel twitter and many list if you are interested in Kata, feel free to contact by any of them so that's all any question All right, thank you, Tao. Anybody has any questions? Yeah, I, I have uh, two, um, if, but but I, I can wait for others first. I always seem to be the, the one talking here. Anybody <laughs> else have any questions? Yeah, I'm pretty familiar with this project as I've been a contributor, so it's a bit, yeah. Anybody okay. else? Okay, well, while we wait for others, I'll, I'll ask mine so long. Um, uh, so first question is, I, could you, first of all, thanks for a great, a great presentation. Very, very interesting, uh, very informative, and particularly your $2 plans look very interesting. Um, so could you sort of summarize, um, you know, if, if, if I took a KVM QMU VM, um, I mean, the, the basic process is that I uh, load the guest kernel um, and then boot whatever's in the root file system, um, and then I have a a running virtual machine, right? Um, yes. And and that takes, uh, I, I haven't done it for a while, but I'm guessing something in the order of a minute. Uh, is that is that around about accurate? Yeah, yes, yes. 
Okay. And now uh, it sounds like you do essentially the same thing, um, but you have presumably a smaller kernel uh, and a smaller root file system. Um, and so, it, so, so building a kernel and, and stripping out all the stuff you don't need is, is a reasonably straightforward process. And then similarly stripping down a root file system to only be the stuff that you need um, is, is fairly straightforward. So what is the difference between that and Kata containers? Um, and I mean, how do you, how do you get this almost hundred X speed up other than by, you know, building a smaller custom kernel by excluding all the mod modules and things you don't need and, and uh, you know, removing things from the root file system uh, that you boot with. Yeah, I, I think there, there are many uh, two, di two differences between them. The first one is in, you know, in order to cut down the speed and, uh, and the consumption, we have a very minimum hardware support for in, in Qmu. So we, we customize Qmu as well. So there, there, are, there are very small, the memory footprint is very small. The device emulation is very small. And yeah. and uh, be, when we started uh, on the project, we actually were defaulting to to Cumulet. Then then it is developed by Intel. And uh, as we as we we are developing Kata, and the Intel team are sending most of the Cumulet features to upstream Cumul. So that's why we are switching. We we have switched to upstream Cumul. Because we, because before that the upstream cumul is the overhead of the upstream cumul is way above the the cumul net. So yes, yeah. So yeah, right now the the cumul overhead is low because most of the cumul net features are upstream now. And but still we customer we and there, there's an important feature introduced by by the Intel team is that is a QMU cam mode support so that every mo every component of the QEMU can be cast, can be configured independently. So and with, with that we we can make make the make the, the virtual machine manager very small right now. And uh, that's the first difference. The second difference between Kata and uh, virtual machine is in life cycle management. Uh, with, a, with, with a virtual machine, you manage it like a virtual machine. You, you create a virtual machine, you pause it, you, you, you snapshot it, you, you shut that into like a virtual machine in, and uh, it's, it's inside of the infrastructure, infrastructure and the service world. But uh, with Kata containers, the life, the life cycle is a, uh, is a container and uh, or, or or a port sandbox. So so all your workload is integrated into the container world. Instead of managing a virtual machine, you are managing a container. So so you, you instead of say you create a virtual machine and install install everything there and run your application, you create a you you build a container image. You put you create a pod YAML for it, submit it to Kubernetes, and and then that the Kubernetes Kubernetes that Kubernetes schedule it and manage all the life cycle of it. So then that's a main difference, I think. Okay, um, I, I still don't I, I still don't quite understand where the, the sort of hundred x speed up comes from because. Um, yeah, I mean, Kubernetes seems to have very little to do with with the actual yeah, launching yeah. of a single um, a single virtual machine. In this case, um, uh, yeah, you, you, if you are really interested in about speed, and I, I have some data we just recently found out, found out actually made um, to to start a QEMU inside with. with um, with Kata to start up QGMU, you you basically spent one hundred to two hundred milliseconds, and uh, to uh, then 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 we be include create the KVM environment to create the all the the QGMU emulation and also start boot the guest kernel. 
and uh, next next is to start the we um, there is no oh the we implement a cut agent inside the inside of the the guest uh, that that will be run and the init process so that that we with that start that's about twenty or thirty milliseconds so in total you can you can start a and without if you just run one run hello world for example if you have an image run hello world you can start you can create from nothing to to you to to the point that you see hello world the string come out then that would be below 300 milliseconds that's what we can do now Yes, and just to clarify, my, my, I'm not doubting that. What I'm what I'm trying to understand is if I if I ran a hello world in a in a plain KVM QMU container with a stripped down kernel and with nothing uh, excessive in my root file system, um, if I did that, and then I also did what you just described on Carter containers, I don't understand what what is happening in the KVM QMU case without Carter containers um, compared to Carter containers? Like what accounts for the 100x speed up? Uh, I'm still not clear on what that is. Um, um, yeah, but, but actually, maybe we can take it offline. I think we're out of time now anyway. So, so I can take that question offline or go and do some research. Um, it's still a little unclear to me, I must say. Okay, then maybe we can email and have this have a discussion. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I had one more question actually. Does any has anyone else come up with questions uh, in the interim? No, I don't. I don't have any. I mean, I, yeah. yeah. My last question is is actually very brief. Is is Carter containers uh, part of a foundation at the moment? And uh, if not, are they interested in becoming part of the CNCF? Right now, it is it is part of OpenStack Foundation. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think another uh, interesting thing about Kata is that they also support Firecracker as a VMM. So, and I think the AWS team has actually spent a lot of time optimizing their Firecracker VMM. So for uh, you know, running like serverless type of workloads and uh, using it for AWS Lambda. So, cool. Yeah, and I would I would comment this Philip here that uh, Tao, if you have um, if you have if you have a paper describing the performance you mentioned, maybe you can put a reference to the link on the Slack channel. That would be uh, it. Would be good. And it's just inside we we are testing internally, but okay. yeah, yeah, and then and so if you can post uh, maybe slides and and whatever follow up information on the SIG runtime CNCF Slack channel, that would that would be great. Yeah, uh, I think I can post this slides out. All right. Well, thank you. It's nine o'clock. So thank you everyone for uh, joining. Uh, so we'll have another meeting in, in, uh, in two weeks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.